Well, happy Sabbath, everybody. Hello, everybody online. I don't know, Barbara, Karen online today? Do you know? Don't know. We got a whole bunch out there listening. We have a lot of folks that are uh, homesick. We have people that are traveling today. And um, so here we are. We're traveling today, too. I'm going to talk today about prayer. I'm going to ask you questions up front. I'm going to say, how were your prayers this morning? How were your prayers last night? I'm doing this because I'm trying to make my own prayer time more uh, consistent with more contents and more purpose. Um, in preparation of this message, which this is the third time I've, I've given this message. We were in Las Vegas last week and gave it in Orange County the week before. It is, it is about developing a, a better practice in prayer. Some people, when I ask the question, how are you doing in prayer? They say, yeah, I'm, I'm doing fine. Another is going to say, well, why are you asking that question, Howard? And that right there avoids the answer of, oh, I didn't do that today. I forgot. To these groups, I say, we can never stop improving our prayer skills, which, bottom line, improves our relationship with God the Father. Now, I've been married 42 years last week, I believe, and you know, my, my wife has told me stories about her family, and, and she had a sister, Lily. And Lily's, her, their dad, uh, he was in the Air Force. He did a 20-year stint. At the last of his years, he was put over in Vietnam back in the late 60s, mid-60s. And, and that's when Lily, Tina's sister, was born. Well, he got shipped off to war to Vietnam and Lily was at home and she had an uncle who became her father figure. When Tina's dad returned, Lily didn't know her father. And another story, I have my dad, um, Howard Jr. He was in World War II and he had his first daughter, probably 1944, and she died about two months later. And he never ever got to meet his daughter. And, and likewise, uh, my uh, little baby sister, Bonnie, she never uh, was able to meet her father. Stretching the analogy story with his sisters a little further, there's a lot of people out there that have never had the chance to know God the Father. Uh, perhaps through their life, they never knew him and they died not knowing him. Perhaps they just haven't done it yet. They haven't taken that opportunity yet to know God the Father. You know, the relationship with God the Father is why we need to make prayer a discipline and a practice. Prayers allow us to develop that interactive relationship with God the Father, our Creator. We can learn about the mind and purpose of God through, of course, doing Bible study, by being obedient, uh, by being faithful, by following the truth. But prayer pulls all of our lessons together. We can, we can join our thoughts together and we can get down and we can pray and we can have that discussion with God the Father and the Spirit will, will feed us. But one thing is prayer is a working tool needed, and I repeat, needed, to discover God working in our lives. When we pray, we're alone with God. It's a one-on-one -on -one conversation we're having. We're in a spiritual safe place when we pray. In this safe place when we pray, we can be totally honest as disciples of Jesus Christ and talk about things with him that perhaps we shouldn't be talking about with other people that we know. Very private conversations. God hears and he evaluates all these words that we're speaking, all these thoughts that are coming out uh, with total righteousness. 
uh, with mercy and with personal concern for our salvation and our eternal well-being. So we're going to look at prayer today as a form of self-discipline. And discipline itself is defined as a, a control system established that has set rules and assumed outcomes. One thing we need to look at in this discipline is, is time management. And then we also have to look at what is the, the, the content of our prayers. And then we also have to fight the impulses even during our prayers. So we're going to try and figure out some ways to have a better, better prayer life. You know, a lot of times we find ourselves blaming our lack of prayer on our fast paced society or maybe we blame it on our obsessions of on entertainment the uh, the little video clips that mr snyder was talking about maybe amusement maybe we just like rather go out and play basketball or something and bottom line we can have a addiction to a sin and that sin separates us from god the root cause of a poor prayer practice, guess what? It's, it's time management. It's time management. It's setting in and meeting the goal that you are going to pray to God and you're going to have a set, let's call it an agenda, of things that you're going to discuss at that moment. We're going to look at the model prayer first as uh, an example of how we should pray. It's a real uh, fundamental uh, notion for Christians. And we look at that and best of all, we're learning by example. We're learning by the example of Jesus Christ. So we're gonna look at a few of those today. So the model prayer starts in Luke 11. So Luke 11. And it's verse 1, if you're taking notes. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So Jesus said to him, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is a point when we take time to praise God the Father for his amazing deeds, uh, for the aspects of his character. Uh, we take time to realize he is our friend uh, and that we can also take time to contemplate his throne. I've talked to uh, some people in the process of giving this and preparing this and they say, you know, Howard, when I when I pray to God, I, I think of God's throne. I think of the, the sea of glass, and I come through the sea of glass, and then I see the 24 elders at the throne, and then I come before the throne, and he, God has the, the, the hair white as snow, and the eyes burning like fire, and the, the garment that is just magnificent. And for some folks, that is, that is the, the, the vision that they need to have in their mind. But then Jesus continues, says, your kingdom come. Well, what about God's kingdom can we think about? What makes his kingdom so wonderful? Why do we want his kingdom to come? Is it about the attitudes? Is it about health? Is it about abundance? Is it about eternal life? And Jesus goes on to say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's interesting. You, you want God's will to be done, but sometimes we don't know God's will. What is God's will? We pray that we understand it, one. We read the book, the scripture, and we see what his will is. This is where we learn his purpose, his goals, his values. We learn about his character, his personage. Luke 11, 3, give us this day our daily bread. We thank God for the goodness of our physical needs. He is supplying us. The spiritual and physical bread that 
It gives us strength in, in body, strength in mind and spirit. We thank God for his grace and his Holy Spirit. We thank him for a great day at work, for the love you have for your family. So many things you can thank God for, and we should. Luke eleven four and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Here's where we are asking God, please cleanse me, Father. I have sinned. I've done things that have been contrary to your goodness, to your good word. I've embarrassed myself for you, Father. We consider the holy law, why it's perfect. And as we're being forgiven, we can't forget to forgive others that have wronged us. And we can consider mercy towards others. Have toning down our whole attitude of, of antagonism towards other folks. We can ask for protection against temptation. Have that Holy Spirit shelter us and, and wall us and protect us. You know, we're in spiritual bondage and entrapment. And we've got to ask God, please, Father, keep us, keep us free of, of the, the, the snares and the wiles of the devil that are out there. You know, when we have a definite bias towards viewing prayer as asking for things, we have to realize the Bible model is, is about three things in prayer. Three basic items. Praising God for all his greatness, for who he is, for his holiness. Confessing our sins and then seeking forgiveness so we're not separate from God. And then asking for blessing, help, and wisdom, deliverance, and intercessions for other people. But it continues in Luke 11, verses 5 through 8. There's more to this. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend, and go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has come to visit me on his journey. He arrived at my house very late, and I have nothing to set before him. I have nothing to offer him as a host. And then this friend who you're knocking on his door is going to answer and say, Don't trouble me. The door is closed. It's shut. My children are asleep. You're going to wake everybody up in the house. I need three loaves of bread. Please. I have a friend coming over. No. Please. I need the bread. I say to you, though he will not rise and give it to him because he is his friend... He will because of your persistence. He'll rise. He'll get up. He'll give it to you. As many as you need. Persistence. That's a big issue with prayer. Having persistence. In another example. We are shown that Jesus often withdrew alone. Into places to pray. Luke 5.16 has that example. Uh, staying in Luke, Luke 22, we can turn to Luke 22. I like keeping the turning of the pages to a minimum. Uh, this is about the prayer in the garden, Luke 22, verses 39 through 46. Uh, this would have been an event that happened when they had just finished their uh, foot washing service and, and the final meal with Jesus before he was crucified and they were going to go out into the garden to pray. Uh, so it starts in Luke 22, 39. It says, coming out, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives. And he was, as he was accustomed, and his disciples followed him. Well, just thinking the, the time from going from the city across the Kidron Valley and, and walking up to um, the Mount of Olives. That would have been a little bit of time there itself. And when he came to the place, he said to the disciples, pray 
that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he himself knelt down and prayed. So a stone's throw, I'm, I'm really lousy at baseball. I can't throw a baseball to save my life, but I could probably throw a stone about 20 yards maybe, maybe. So it's pretty close. I mean, it's within an eye shot. It could be within ear shot that you could hear Jesus praying. And verse 42, it says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So here Jesus is, again, integrating that part of the uh, sample prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And verse 43, then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And Jesus, being in agony, he prayed even more earnestly. Have you ever had pain from something that happened to a family member, death or something? And you're, you, you, you pray and you just, it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper in prayer. Well, Jesus was being very earnest in his prayer. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's pretty stressful for that to happen, for your capillaries to burst. What a bunch of stress that must have been. But then when Jesus rose up from prayer, he had come to his disciples and he found them, found them what? They're asleep. They're sleeping from sorrow. And he said to him, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you fall into temptation. We tend to think of prayer as something that we must keep private. That praying in front of others or with others risk being prideful, showing, oh, I'm so holy and I'm so great. Let me, let's pray together. And, and maybe at that point you may feel puffed up. But when we look at the book of Matthew and Jesus teaching on prayer. This is going to be, I'm going to turn the chapter, Matthew 6. We'll turn to Matthew 6. I was picked on by somebody a couple weeks ago for not actually looking at my Bible, Carmen. <laughs> you know, our pastor, Mr. Weber, he says, you always take your Bible with you. And even if I have it written down here in my notes, we still need to be looking at our Bible because you know what? I've seen it happen. I've seen people write the wrong scriptures down and then they're flipping going, oh, that's not the right scripture. All right. So Matthew 6, 5 through 8, we should be there. Jesus says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the street that may be seen by man. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Well, I think of a number of years ago, Tina and I were in Jerusalem and we were able to visit the Western Wall. And there was obviously a bunch of people praying at the wall, some of them quietly, but there were some out there that were more boisterous and a spectacle, call it a spectacle. You bring your, your, your big old table out, your desk, and you've got shelves on it, you've got all your books out, and you got all your garments on, and you're just sitting there, and everybody's watching you do your, your prayer. What did Jesus say? They have their reward. Matthew 6, 6. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you've shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Well, most intimate prayer to God is done in private. And some prayer is done in a more public setting, like we have here at church services. We ask blessings on children time to time when there's, there's infants in the congregation. Hands are laid on them, and it's a congregational prayer. Uh, there's been times when we ask for prayers for those who are sick from, from the podium up here. Congregational prayer. There's no biblical command against either holding hands either while praying in such a setting. Many families hold hands 
when they pray at night before dinner. Tina and I, we hold our hands when we bow our heads asking a blessing on our meal. There's nothing against that practice in the Bible. Um, one of the complaints with this idea of holding hands, oh, you're creating a prayer circle. Oh, you're making a circle. Oh, don't you know that's the sign of this or that? Oh, you made a square. Isn't that the sign of this or that? Face it, folks. If you got five or six people and you hold hands, you're going to make some kind of shape. So it's, 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 it's not about that. Now, Jesus continues in Matthew. This is verses 6, 7, and 6, 8. He says, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Well, vain repetition. I think when I was a kid, oh, when I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I rise, I don't even remember it, but it's like people teach their kids these, these repetitious prayers that don't mean anything. We could even use the sample prayer that we looked at in Luke 11, and we could you know, say that prayer just as it's written over and over, day after day, and if we're not adding in the, the details, the, the meat into that prayer, the heart into that prayer, it too becomes a vain repetition. And Jesus says, don't be like them, for your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. Now we've been looking at a few examples of how Jesus constructed his prayers and his practice uh, and digging deeper into this uh, development of content and practice. Uh, let's think of some other things about prayer that we really should consider. First, plan a time to pray. Jesus made a point to have time for himself to pray. He would go out alone and he would pray. Daniel, as his custom was, he would pray three times a day. He would morning, afternoon, and evening. He would kneel down and he prayed. He would give thanks to God. So planning time for prayer really is number one on getting your practice together. When are you going to do it? Do you pray in the morning, afternoon, as evening, as Daniel did, or more or less? You know, prayer can take a lot of time out of the day if you're really praying earnestly. But most people can find the time. The trouble is creating the habit and being careful of making it just a callous routine. Jesus warned us not to be like the hypocrites and do it for show. Our prayer should not be a task. This should be something we look forward to. It should be that conversation we're looking forward to every day. It shouldn't be simply a check off. I, okay, I did my prayers. Now I can go to work and do whatever I need to do. Prayer is the time to build connection and relationship with God the Father. I think of a faith, again, a trip to the Middle East, it really did a number on our heads. Okay, you're waking up at 4.30 in the morning and you're hearing the minarets, the call to prayer. You know, it's interesting that for the Muslim society, they have a very strict routine on prayer. But it's interesting that if you're over there and you see somebody not praying when everybody else is, you automatically think, oh, infidel, he's, he's not faithful. So it, it's really not a structure that is good. Routine should not be forced. It should be desired. You should want to do it. It should come automatically to you. Our prayer routines can always use fine tuning and become better. We can always communicate better with God. In fact, our prayer life should be fully integrated into all the way we live and think and do. But now here's a common problem. Has everybody started to pray and then drifted off? 
Does your mind start to wander? Do you start thinking about dinner? Do you start thinking about the problems that you have to solve for the day, the phone calls you have to make, the people you have to meet? Or do you just fall asleep? You ever fall asleep praying? It happens. You know, there's a really easy fix for that. Really, really simple. Pray out loud. Move your lips. You won't fall asleep when your lips are moving. You're going to be focusing on what you're saying. And you know what? It takes three or four times longer to say the word in your lips than to think it when you're praying. It, it really builds. But if you don't believe that is a, is a proper way, let's look at an example in the Bible. Okay, we've been to 1 Samuel already today. So we're going to go back there. This is 1 Samuel 1 that we're going to look at. And this is the story about Hannah. Hannah was the, the mother of Samuel. And in Samuel 1, verse 12, And they, see, here's one. Oh, Samuel 2, the wrong book. Put my glasses away too soon. You know, it's just in that zone that do I need them or do I not need them? Okay, so 1 Samuel 1, verse 12. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart only, her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli, the, the priest, thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. So verbalizing your prayers is very helpful. It helps us slow down, concentrate, and focus on our prayers. But we can also write down what we need to pray about as a reminder list. Everyone has their own style of organizing. We need to use what works well for us. Many people find writing down items that need to be addressed in prayer. Um, many people will use a, a prayer booklet. Okay, in my prayer booklet, I like to have the model prayer so I can be reminded of the structure. But also, I know in Orange County, we have a, a flyer that goes out and it has a list of prayers. Well, it's really simple just to cut that out and I use a staple or staple it into the book and, and know those people and not forget those people. Uh, when somebody asks me personally to, to pray for them, add it into the book. You know, sometimes using post-it notes are really good because sometimes there's only temporary prayers that need. So you, you don't have to keep it in your book the whole time. Using prayer lists and writing down what you want to pray about really helps you pray stronger and longer. Um, recurring needs like spouse and family, job, local church area, you could put tabs in your book and make sure you're hitting all the areas, all kinds of ways to organize, but it's a great way to remember. I also will take my outlines that I have for my messages. I will put them before God. I will pray for them, pray for the understanding, pray that I'm not missing anything. And I'll tell you what. Every time something pops up, I this time something interesting popped up. It was Colossians 3. So let's look at Colossians 3. It's like, it's like God saying, Howard, you forgot this. 
You forgot this really important point, Howard. Okay, Colossians 3. And uh, I'll just get to the meat of it. Verse 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, and that includes prayer, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We pray through Jesus Christ. He is our intercessor. And on this notion of intercessory prayer, somebody says, so will you pray for me, pray for my family? They ask you specifically to give a prayer. Well, intercessory prayer is asking requests of God for others. It is a characteristic of a true Christian. The Bible has many examples of those who pray for others, most notably Jesus Christ. He even prayed for those who were crucifying him, saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. I live in an apartment. I have to share my parking space with a guy with a big, big truck. I expect every week that this nut is going to put a dent in my door again. I can't, I, I got dents like th three feet long, so one after the other. The guy even took a hammer to my hood one day and put a nice ding in it. It's like, what I do to the guy? I don't know, but I have to forgive him because obviously he doesn't know what he's doing to my beautiful car. This happens to us all the time. There's people out there, they're... People running off the road, driving 90 miles an hour, and you're trying to do your speed limit and follow the laws and the rules. Sometimes these people, they don't think. They're not thinking of you. They're not thinking of me. They're thinking of themselves. Bad four-letter word, S-E-L-F. Anyway, Paul, in his epistles, constantly mentions his prayers for his brethren. He wrote to the Philippians, always in every prayer of mine, making a request for you all with joy. In other words, in other instances, uh, Paul tells the Colossians that he and his companions do not cease to pray for you. And as he prayed for others, Paul asked others to pray for him and fellow workers. He wrote to the Thessalonians, Thessalonians, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may be run swiftly and be glorified. Paul is a great example of a Christian who kept the needs of his brethren in mind. His chief concern was their spiritual welfare. Secondarily, standing in the faith. Well, I guess it's all together, spiritual welfare and standing in the faith. Christians ought to pray like that for each other all the time. We really need to. There's also a continual opportunity to pray for the health and needs of others. The Apostle James wrote about this when he told Christians to pray for one another that you may be healed. Maybe you have an affliction, but again, you make that effort to pray for others. Make that love, outgoing concern for others a priority, and God can bless you. Christians are told to be the light of the world. We should also pray and hope for the world's salvation. What a mess this world is in. This is how Daniel prayed for his nation, asking God to forgive the sins of his people that had caused their captivity in Babylon. In Daniel chapter 9, he records his prayer saying, He set his face towards the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplication. He pleaded with God saying, O Lord, according to your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned against your city, Jerusalem. Likewise, Moses beseeched God for the nation of Israel when he, he prayed, pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy. And Paul exhorted that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving thanks for all men are good. All these biblical examples of holy people making intercessory prayer, beseeching God for others, demonstrates the role of a mediator. 
That's being very Christ-like. Christ is our mediator. This mirrors his role between God and men. Centuries before Christ's ministry, Isaiah prophesied of him pouring out his soul unto death and being numbered with the transgressors for whom he made intercession. Jesus is dying and bleeding and in pain, and he's saying, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Indeed, he died for our sake, and now the risen Christ, according to Hebrews 7.25, always lives to make intercession for us. He has entered into heaven itself and now appears in the presence of God for us. So having that, that connection with Jesus, praying in his name, through his name, and having that example of, of praying for others as he did is a very good Christian example. Um, we have many biblical examples showing how to make intercessory prayer. After all, we are told to be imitators of God. Therefore, as Christ appears before us, so Christians come before God's throne on behalf of others. We can do that. We can come before God for others. It's a characteristic of a Christian. What about when you don't really know what to pray about? I mean, you, you got your book and you have people, but... There's just something gnawing away at you. You just, you just don't know what it is. And sometimes our prayers can be weak. Uh, maybe we, we don't know the scriptures well enough. Maybe we didn't take good notes and we're confused about God's will. Maybe we've been asked to pray about somebody else and we don't know the exact situation. We don't know the circumstances. These are situations when we need to rely on the Holy Spirit to Fill in the gaps. For this, you must have faith. For this, you need to ask for help. One of the most important scriptures concerning this is in Romans 8.26. This also needs to be written down in your book, Romans 8.26. Very important. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For when we do not know what we should pray for, as we should, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. We need to claim that prayer. We need to claim what this is asking for, that God will Provide that Holy Spirit to intercede for the things that I don't know, the gaps that I don't understand. All right, where am I? There we go. Um, so make it one of your goals to pray long enough that you get past the feeling of routine, that you're actually having a conversation, that the Spirit is interceding for you and guiding you in that conversation. But understand that part of this conversation, if you're praying long enough, you're realizing that you're, you're in a different spiritual dimension. You're in the dimension of God. You're, you're in a completely different place. You're praying right to eternity. And you need to know it's a different place. Um, a great starting point to having a rewarding prayer session is talking to the very creator God, the sustainer in your universe. We need to invoke that request. I know what I should pray for as I should. Please, please, Father, allow the Spirit to make that intercession with me. We are flesh. So we got asked God to help us understand this other dimension we're in. And we request help to focus and prioritize our thoughts. So before you pray, get organized. There are many situations and needs and requests and 
I can't remember them all. You know, in the morning, I'm not the brightest guy in the morning. I mean, it seems like it's 10 o'clock before the brain really starts to work sometimes. But you start, and you have the Spirit help you. And understand that prayer is a working tool. It's a tool. It's not, a, it's not necessarily a task you have to use. It's, it's a tool that you are developing, that you are sharpening. And we use it to discover God the Father working in our lives. When we pray, we're alone with God, building that relationship, that nice one-on-one -on -one relationship. When we pray, we are in a spiritual safe place. We're going to be protected from the evil that is outside when we're, when we're in direct contact with God the Father. Prepare your prayer practice by having time. Set aside one, two, three times a day to be alone in prayer. Make it a practice to have some type of written uh, content to, to rely on when, you're, when your mind isn't thinking about the neighbor's problem. Um, have it written down. It really helps because we do forget names. We forget names even, even when you meet somebody immediately, you forget. Um, Christ has given us some basic structure and content suggestions. Use them. And he most, I won't say most importantly, but I think it's pretty important, persistence. You don't get your, your answer to your prayer today. Keep asking. Be persistent. God will hear you. And lean on the gift of the Holy Spirit. Pray I, that he will... Um, Allow the Spirit to make intercession for us. And understand that effective, powerful prayer in the name of Jesus Christ opens the door to all eternity. Indeed, Jesus died for our sake, and now the risen Christ always lives to make intercession for us in our prayers.